Yeah. Hey, hey Scott, uh, well, Scott if that. you don't mind me asking uh, just a, a quick thing before you well, started Go recording already. I was going to ask you if you mind speaking a little bit about that experience of yours. Uh, if we, if you could ask a few questions about that, even if it's on re on recording. That's yeah, fine. I don't really care. Just go ahead. Yeah, I think we can get it's back great. to what I was talking about, but. Um, uh, it, it, it's a great topic because I, as I was, if you recall, last week we talked about, uh, I asked about uh, a series of videos so um, where I could maybe get the hang of, of all of the, the things you've been doing lately and you, and you suggested that I would see your series of videos on YouTube. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. And from this, from last week to now, I've seen about five videos of the 10 that are available. And I saw a clear difference between your personality from the first videos and the one I saw last week. Mm -hmm. It was so clear to me the difference that I immediately uh, conceptualized that you must have touched Nimana somehow because the the difference is very, very much uh, perceptible, you know. So I was go I was planning to ask about about that to you today, and when I when I come into the group, you were talking about that. Well, in the so the first well in the videos, the clear difference that you see is um, the only difference between the first videos and uh the difference that you see in the other videos is not some unattainable magic thing that happened to me but simply getting into a wholesome state with Damarado and getting on the same page as him and literally being in a state of mind that is free of craving and totally happy just to be right here in this call right now and all of you guys all of you guys can do this like right now with me like if you can just sit here listen to me talking ask questions or whatever but just be totally satisfied with the experience of just being on a voice call and there's nothing to worry about right now and just get on the same page as me then you have access to that same uh experience of being free of dukkha and it's not it's not special or extraordinary. So <laughs> literally anyone can do it. And um, there's d different tools and tricks, right? But the main thing that that uh, did it for me was just the enthusiasm around the Dhamma. So my interest. Um, also, it's clear it's clear to see. It's clear to see um, whether or not someone knows what they're talking about from uh, all the signals and cues of that person. And um, I would say the main the main defining factor of whether you're in jhana or not um, for most of the time is just the absence of restlessness. So can you sit here and just relax? <laughs> is that it's that simple? Like, can you sit here and just be totally comfortable in your own body? Take a deep breath, right? That's why we do Anapanasati. Um, you're literally breathing to relax the body. And uh, if the if, if any problems come up, um feel free to ask a question so this is the simple instruction of what to do um take deep breaths um if there's any tensions in your body physically relax the tensions so it's like it's like when you go to bed at night you have to go through uh 
progression of relaxation of the body getting more and more relaxed, right? It's the same thing for meditation, except for we're um, we're fully fully awake during this process. So um, there's a big difference between sleepiness and tranquility. So tranquility, you have the full capacity to um, be hyper aware of your immediate sensory experience. So in in meditative states, instead of thinking about, um, oh, that guy at work, or your oh that ex girlfriend she left me, what, <laughs> or <laughs> um, whatever it is that's uh, making you feel bad, you're literally just hyper aware of your immediate sensory phenomena. Like um, a good uh, an analogy I like to use um, is like a skilled hunter. So a skilled hunter walking in the forest totally aware of his surroundings to the extent that he can hear a twig crunch in the leaves 20 yards away. So that's not and quite... the forest is your body. Is your body. And the what? The forest is is an analogy for your body. Your body and all of your experiences. So I can hear and your the, mind too. I can hear the rain hitting the windowsill behind me. I can see all of your faces. I can see the light coming through the window over there. I can feel the sensation of my butt against the seat. The feeling of my breath, my tongue, my forehead. All of these are the twigs in the forest. So you're the totality of your experience. And this is not quite the same as concentration, right? Because you yeah, because you're not just aware of one thing. So there's many things um, that are quote unquote the object of meditation. And the object of meditation is literally just the current experience that you're having. So uh, the whatever is going on in your mind is the object of meditation. Whatever is going on in your visual perceptual field is the object of meditation. Whatever is going on with the sensations of your breath is the object of meditation. Whatever is going on with the sounds is the object of meditation. Whatever is going on with any of your sensory experiences is meditation itself, as long as you don't conceptualize a past and a future and you just stay here. And if there's dukkha that comes up, analyze, analyze how that happens. Did you think about something from the past or the future? Because it can be very tricky. So you might think that you're doing meditation, but now you're thinking about doing meditation in the future or whether you did meditation in the past, and that's not meditation, right?
so that you, the idea that you're going to experience nibbana sometime in the future if you only would just meditate correctly or how, I need to get back into jhana or I'm going to experience the jhanas in the future if I improve my meditation is a uh, illusion that all is a fabrication of your own mind because there is no jhana in the future and there is no nibbana in the future if there's nibbana it's in the it's right now so that's why nirvana is samsara it's just that uh, you're either awake or you're asleep, but it's never in the future. And you can gladden your mind around the fact that you don't need to worry about anything in the past or the future. So this is a wholesome thought. I could just sit here and be happy with absolutely nothing, not a care in the world. How amazing is that? What all the all the lengths I went to to find satisfaction, and it turns out I don't need to do anything to be satisfied. I could just sit right here and be happy. That's the only trick. That's the only game of the universe. There's nobody more enlightened than you. Um, there's no Buddhas, there's just the experience of reality as it unfolds moment to moment. And this experience operates by certain rules and certain causes and conditions that either produce dissatisfaction or produce satisfaction. The funny thing is, I don't really know what first jhana is. I can experience first jhana, but if I try to think about what it actually is, that's just a concept in my mind. It's either the, the experience of first jhana is the knowing of first jhana. I can try to think about past experiences of jhana but that's just an after image I'm creating in my mind. And to realize the way that I got into jhana to begin with was to let go of all of the uh, striving, all of the wanting things to be different and just stop, just stop here in this moment and pay attention, pay attention to what's going on. If you catch the mind making problems that aren't actually there, problems that aren't here in this room, you know that the mind is going off course again. I see you, Mara, okay? It's playing tricks on you. Uh, Mara tries to play tricks on you to get you uh, stuck in the cycle of it. Because he, he, he's very entertained by everyone going on the hamster wheel of samsara. Uh, so to adopt the right attitude of a noble one is to essentially take off the costume 
and stop being a clown for someone else's entertainment and to find satisfaction and to renounce all of the ways that don't really lead to satisfaction. All of the sensual desires, all of the pleasurable experience, even jhanas, um, are all impermanent. So the only way to truly be satisfied is to stop wanting anything at all whatsoever. Either spiritual or physical. Mental or bodily. Uh, if anyone has topic <laughs> they want to talk about, we can continue to sit here in meditation. Um, there's no agenda for this call. But um, if anyone has a question... I'd like to ask a question, if you don't mind, about yourself. As I said, I, I'm on video five from this series of 10 on you. And uh, I'd like to know, if you don't mind saying it, when uh, did you have this experience of changing of personality? Time-wise, I mean. Um. It gets kind of complicated um, because I have many experiences of changing personality because my personality changes all the time. I guess I don't really have a personality. <laughs> so this is actually the first fetter. <laughs> the first fetter is literally called personality view. Okay. Yeah. And the personality view is the idea that you do have a continuous personality. Which, mm -hmm. if we take a look at our actual direct experience, we'll see that your thoughts and feelings and your personality isn't the same one moment to the next, let alone one day to the next, let alone one week to the next. So for me to pick out a change in personality is like, it's like taking a drop out of the ocean. It doesn't really make sense, but... But there was a first time where I got into um, I got into jhana through the method that Damarado prescribed to me. Um, up until that point, I was just doing do nothing meditation, so completely passive. Um, I wouldn't do anything about. Um, the activity of my own mind that was causing dukkha. Um, and when I first called Damarado, uh, he gave me the practice to simply talk myself into into it. So, <laughs> and that's essentially what I do every Wednesday on a song call. When I'm teaching you guys, I'm literally just talking myself into a wholesome state of mind. So, um, it's, it's beneficial for me and um, um, hopefully beneficial for other people too, but there's <laughs> there's total indifference with regards to whether something lands. Uh, but <laughs> Scott, yeah, you you said earlier you don't know what it is, but you just explained what it is. Yeah, that, Talk, so yeah, it's you know, but I I can't just. It's not as straightforward. It's not like a straightforward. Especially in the beginning, you have to kind of trick yourself into being happy almost. 
um, because you've been tricking yourself into being miserable for so long that it feels like a trick to actually just be satisfied. Um, so uh, because you've been talking yourself into feeling bad for so long, you have to start talking yourself into feeling good. And uh, one day I was walking in the park um, full of sorrow, lamentation, as per usual. And then I was like, you know what? Let me try it. <laughs> Let me try what he told me to do. And so I just talked myself into feeling happy. And then that initial rush I got from the realization that it's possible um, sort of developed like a feedback loop that just kept growing and growing. So it's almost like an empowerment rush. So it's the realization that uh, you have the power within yourself to feel how you want to feel. And that's extremely liberating. And you become your own master. So you, you no longer have a god. You no longer have a master. And uh, in that moment where you can be happy with nothing, you are the emperor of the universe in that moment. You have what everyone wants. And nothing, and nothing anyone does can take it away from you. And all the kings, all the richest people in the world, when they're not happy, don't have anything. And it's nothing compared to the direct experience of your own satisfaction. So when was that? Um, I think it was after like the first or second call. I don't know. Like you can look on the on the day it was published, and it was around that general time. Um, but I was saying beforehand, uh, I had been practicing Advaita um, and like non duality for probably like three years, so it wasn't like as if I would never meditated before, but uh. The maiden meditation I did was, oh, it's all one reality and like, uh, there wasn't really the right effort in the equation, but it did, I wouldn't say it was fruitless, right? So a lot of times practicing, um, the idea that everything is non-dual. Okay, there is no separate individual self. It can lead to similar themes, and there's definitely parallels between the Dhamma and uh, Advaita. But um, the problem is the Advaita takes the self or your true nature to be a permanent, lasting uh, ground of being that's continuous. And this is a barrier to Nibbana. So, because there's just going to be some clinging for some self identification left over. But it can get you into, um, if you really do Advaita to the full fruition of Advaita, it can get you into um, boundless jhana territory. Um, but you would mistake the boundless jhana for enlightenment. But the boundless jhana is not um, enlightenment because it's still something happening within. It's still a creation of the dream. It's still happening within the uh, fabricated reality. Uh, so it's uh, fundamentally limited. And there's nothing. These states are good states to be in. Um, but the problem is it's impermanent. So when it's gone. You're going to be bringing up the past and clinging to the past, and you're going to you're going to be identifying with it and wondering why the same results aren't happening. So you'll be, oh, I'm the self, I'm God. Why am I suffering? And you'll be in a state of denial, and you'll just keep telling yourself the same lies over and over again. Nope, I'm I'm God. I'm it's there's no separate self. Um, and you could see people <laughs> uh, 
um, if you interact with most of these people in the community, they'll just get into lengthy arguments and stuff about it. Um, and there's a lot of like mental gymnastics that goes into it. When actually the practice is so simple of literally just uh, purifying your mind, relaxing the body, and uh, not creating dukkha for yourself um, unnecessarily. It's so simple. Just breathe. Just breathe and be here. Um, all of this other stuff is just extra baggage. You're not trying to gain anything. You're trying to lose stuff that's weighing you down until you <laughs> until you don't own a thing. So, um, not owning anything mentally, physically, in whatever way you can think about it, is a path to awakening. I don't don't own your thoughts, don't own your feelings, don't take ownership of your body, don't take ownership of anything in the world, don't take ownership of any of your senses. And it, it will become clear to you that these are all impermanent, constantly changing, dreamlike almost. Are you familiar with the 6R technique uh, that teaches uh, some, uh, a technique to help you let craving go? Um, yeah, I've heard of it, but um, at the end of the day, 6R, like... It, it like, is understood as a, as a kind of right effort, right? Right. Um, but I, 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 um, I don't know all the R's, but like, I don't think that you need that many R's. You just need one. <laughs> There's only one right effort. And the thing is, right effort isn't a formula that I could give you like a list of right effort things to do and check off the list. It doesn't really work like that. So it's like, you kind of just do it. <laughs> it's sorry to say, but there's a there's a um, there's a story with the centipede, like uh, this this somewhere in the sutta, and I, I haven't read it, but I, I heard it Domorado tell it to me, and uh, so they asked the centipede with a thousand legs or one hundred legs or whatever, um, how do you know how to move all your legs in in perfect coordination? And which time do you move all the legs? And he's like, and then he says, I don't know. Don't ask me that. I just do it. So <laughs> the centipede doesn't know how it moves all the legs. It just moves the legs. Right effort is the same. So it's like nothing about six R's or a step of things to do ever pops into my mind. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the simple act of breathing and uh, practice being satisfied. Um, there's some suttas that um, get into more detail about the Eightfold Noble Path. Um, I forgot the title of the sutta, but um, the one that talks about how right view comes first. Okay. So right view is stopping and looking. So it's kind of like wakey wakey to things. You stop and you have to stop and look what's going on in order to make any changes about it.
I've heard of the uh, six hours before. I think there are some items that can be helpful if you're not uh, <laughs> clinging to them, you know, and like, oh, I'll have to follow the formula. Exactly. Um, again, like re-smiling. Smiling can be quite helpful, especially if you can just enjoy smiling for smiling's sake, if you will, or whatever. Just smiling right now in this moment is enough. You know, that can be quite helpful. I think there's some mind-body connection stuff going on with that as well. That can be quite useful with, like, the breathing. Um, that can be quite marvelous. Um, yeah. In terms of gladdening both, you know, smiling with the body, gladdening up with the body, but also smiling with the mind, gladdening the mind. That can also, you know, kind of hit in both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, just practice having a smile on your face. Try it. Even if you don't feel happy, just smile. Okay? Just even the slightest smile is fine. Just just make sure the, the <laughs> ends of your... Aaron, make sure there's a slight upturn on the ends of the mouth. And uh, yeah. it, it requires... Actually, yeah, it just requires... Sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it just takes a little bit of effort, right, to put a smile on your face. But then uh, before you know it, you actually are smile. like you, you feel that you're smiling, you're happy. So it's the same thing we do with the thoughts. So it seems like, oh, I am, I'm not happy, like I'm, I'm not satisfied right now. But we just fake it to, you just think happy thoughts and then eventually uh, you get on a roll, one one wholesome thought after another, and uh, it develops its own inertia. And that inertia becomes genuine and authentic. And uh, when you cross that threshold, uh, now it's just a matter of being on the lookout for the first unwholesome thought that's going to take you out of it. Um, so you, you're, you watch... You're watchful, ever watchful, making sure um, that everything is going according to plan uh, right now. And if an unwholesome thought pops up, uh, you you get better at sidestepping it, side slipping like a boxer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And it just comes with practice. But it, yeah, it does take a little bit of effort. And that's what was missing when with uh, Advaita. So I started practicing doing this. And uh, the changes have been remarkable. And I, and also, I've never looked back since. Because once I started getting the results, I realized this is the only way. This is the way. So uh, it, that's kind of the end of doubt or uh, going beyond doubt. Of, oh, is this the right thing to do? Is this the path? How about this one? So you fold a paper airplane, right? You make it so its form is the way you know it will, will work, right? Mm -hmm. But then when you when you let go of it and it's flying, there's nobody folding it while it's flying. Yeah, but it's it's still so flying. So um, that's a good one. Another good one is getting a car rolling from um, a dead stop. So uh, let's say your car battery died. Um, and I don't know if anyone drives a stick shift, but there's a way that you can get the stick shift to start simply by getting the car rolling putting it into uh, first gear and then uh, releasing the, cl the clutch and it starts the engine actually. So it takes a lot of effort to get that car rolling. But once you get rolling on like flat or a slight slope, you hop in the front seat really quick and you just ride it. Um, Jana works the same way. So don't let up on the pushing until there's enough energy. 
So you have to keep applying and sustain wholesome thought, apply and sustain. So build those wholesome feelings. Okay. You just push a little bit and hop in, it might, it's going to stop very quickly. So you have to be relentless and keep going until <laughs> there's an avalanche of, feel, of good feelings. And when there's an avalanche of good feelings, you can just go woo and just like slide right it out, right? Um, how high, how good can you feel? How high can you jump on this thing? It's, it's an, it's like a form of athleticism almost. Um, yeah. So yeah, shorten the goalpost too, even. Uh, the only goal should be to enjoy the next, this breath. So yeah, if you have some goal way off in the distance to enter into some jhanas or have some experiences or whatever, that's missing the point of the practice is to simply be satisfied with this one ah, right here. And then the next one. That's why I like at the end of the call. Um, sometimes someone says, have a good day to Domorado and he says, have a good moment. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, what the fuck is a good day? Like, you're only going to have a good moment or a bad moment. So make your choice about how this moment is going to be. What if the thought is, is still lingering, like the dukkha? Like, it feels like, like this whole talk, I've been just doing the breathing and feeling great. But there's still like five percent of dukkha doubt. This this can't be real. I'm I'm not allowing it. Right. What's so, with that? Um, don't pull on that thread. So there's that little bit of dukkha there. Just don't go. Just don't go in that direction. Just keep keep up with the wholesome thoughts. Um, don't pull on that thread. So it's like a thread. So it's like you have. A blanket or a coat and there's like a thread coming off of it and that's the little bit of dukkha and if you pull on it it's going to unravel the whole thing right so i can just let it drop away let it drop away and just keep applying a sustained wholesome thought um don't go down the like i don't know if you've ever went on reddit and you're browsing the comment section and you there's an unwholesome thread don't open the thread and go down the million lines of of uh, thought unwholesome thoughts that when you go down that way does that make sense you just keep scrolling past it um so you keep applying sustaining thought so it's um the little bit of dissatisfaction the little bit of dukkha that's there um it's not really of interest to us. What's of interest is how good the, this breath is right now in this moment. So, so this, this little rest dukkha, it's okay that it's there. You just kind of ignore it. Yeah, pretty much. Another thing that uh, I would like to add too is that if might not be that it is always there too right this is very much like impermanence it's there for a little bit when we become aware of it but then it just kind of slips away right so there might be this idea that there's this constant string of dukkha but really it's not there it's just there 
when it arises and then it ceases. But when it arises, we think, oh, wow, it's been here this whole time. And then the idea of time comes up and all this jazz. But when we see it like just now, it's like, and we pop it off right now, that's not an issue. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. Make... yeah. Oh, sorry? Um... Uh, wait, let me get the English in my mind. Um, yeah, I kind of, I, I get that totally like conceptualized, but but experience, experiencing it actually still creates doubt, doubt mm. because it's a sense of like, I, I, I can't say uh, that I see this, that's you why, know what I mean? That's why I'm not saying do any of the complicated things like <laughs> notice impermanence of whatever just apply the sustain the wholesome thoughts okay this is what i did and um <laughs> it worked and after the fact when you're already in jhana then you can re you can really be aware of certain characteristics of um reality but uh trying to artificially um take yourself out of dukkha by looking for the prescribed characteristics of reality doesn't work but what does work is putting a smile on your face and taking uh yeah satisfying breaths and stop thinking stop thinking about the stuff that makes you unhappy just be stupid just be a stupid idiot you can <laughs> You don't need to know anything about the Dhamma. You don't need to yeah. be an expert. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't think it's that complicated, though. It's like literally just noticing, okay, when we throw in like a thought of like, oh, congratulations, like that was spotted. Don't have to step in that. Noticing that there is already change. Like impermanence isn't complicated. It's immediate. It's like not conceptual at all when you directly are looking at it. Like it's just that's what it is, right? But it can be like just seeing like, oh, okay, congratulations. It's already, it's already changed. Like that's already changed. We're already, you know, changing. This is already it, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. So doing the apply, sustain, wholesome is just a demonstration mm -hmm. of impermanence. Yeah. But you, um, so the ability to change the mind and then the feelings is the, realization of impermanence by doing by doing it realize impermanence experientially by changing how you feel yeah we're not waiting for change like that kind of change to come on high like we're not waiting for to, to be hit by you know the comma machine in, a, <laughs> in that sort of way that oh we'll, we'll be blessed by that it's like no actually just apply the right um, effort we, we practice the mindfulness, the sati, remembering, the looking, that again, discerning, is this wholesome, is this unwholesome? Very, you know, easy peasy. And then just applying that effort, apply and sustain. Run that around in circles. Bada bing, bada boom, there's confidence. We've seen this so many times, so many times that there isn't like, there isn't, there isn't a shred of doubt. It's just like, okay, we can see it. This is how it is, right? And then the mind's unified. It's it ain't fighting. It's just hey, we can just chill out. <laughs> okay, yeah. so so maybe <laughs> the practice is more like so the practice isn't to like not let dukkha thoughts come up, but more like just dodging by seeing. Make wholesome thoughts. Mm. So don't worry about the dukkha thoughts. Just make wholesome thoughts. Yeah. So make your own wholesome thoughts. Um, apply and sustain. Talk uh, but a wholesome thought could can be like, oh nice, I was able to dodge that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. The the a big misconception is the idea that something is magically going to change without you changing it. So <laughs> nobody's coming to save you. <laughs> You got to save yourself, sadly enough. Um, there's no cosmic Shakti pot coming to magically give you grace from Dukkha. Um, there's nothing I can do to save you. <laughs> you have to do it yourself. 
I did it for myself and I can tell you how to do it, but you have to be the one to do it. And it turns out it's it's really fun when everyone's doing it at the same time because we can all just sit here and smile and shoot the shit with each other and just uh, just appreciate that friendship and that the power of uh, any group, any amount of people um, gathering together and just appreciating the moment, this moment together and not worrying about anything else. So if you think about it, aren't all concepts that you make in your mind are Dukazen because they most of the time make you think about past or future and take you out of present? Yeah, I would say um, concepts aren't necessarily bad, but I'm just going to say yes to that, Marcel, because... <laughs> I don't want you to be thinking about anything right now. So just drop your concepts. Uh, that's one way to get rid of wholesome. Th uh, that's one way to get rid of unwholesome thoughts. Um, you can shove them out by thinking wholesome thoughts, wholesome thoughts, wholesome thoughts. But you can also stop thinking altogether. Stop conceptualizing things. That's why I said be just a stupid idiot with a grin on your face. There's no there's no need to think about things right now. There's nothing you need to do. There's no danger in your immediate environment. What's the problem? That's what I'm saying. What's the problem? There's no problem, it's all good. What about body stuff? Like, I don't know, for example, I've been trying to get my neck in a good position lying down for like 50 minutes now, and it's still annoying me. Well, I don't know, try doing, like try rolling your neck around, just like let it, let your neck stretch like this. There's some tension on this side. Just let it hang for a little bit. And just feel the, the stretch. And if there's some tension in the back, let it hang forward. Even do some of this a little bit, just really gently. Take some deep breaths. And the body is going to die, and you might die after your next breath. So gonna have to let that go too yeah the body's gonna die but uh, we can experience a relaxed and happy body right now uh i don't see any immediate threats <laughs> but an asteroid could come through the 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 atmosphere and strike us here so that's all the more reason not to worry about anything right as aaron's aaron pointed out there um yeah it's you know i'm here for a good time not a long time okay we're going to die everything you think that matters doesn't really matter that much in the grand scheme of things i know you've heard that all before and you don't even get to own the good time you know it's like what can you take with you do you have a skill that will, you know, survive <laughs> through the through the you portal can't. or wherever the change leads? If you have a good time right now, that's enough. So, um, you're never going to have a good time in the past or the future. 
And um, having a good time right now doesn't mean you need to own having a good time because here it is, right? Um, if you're not having a good time and you're thinking about the good time in the past that you owned and now that's causing you dukkha, right? So you can only you can only try to own a good time in the past. Yeah, the Buddha said that. He said, in the good time, there's only the good time. <laughs> right, right. It just, it is what it is. In the good time, it's just a good time. There's no person having a good time. It's just a good time. It's so simple. There's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to cling to. Would you say that tension in the body is an indicator for dukkha or dukkha you missed in the sense of like right now I feel totally relaxed and once I stop paying attention like for 10 seconds I'll notice I don't know my leg getting more tense yeah so tension in the body is dukkha it doesn't if you're experiencing tension in the body you're dissatisfied so if there's tension in the body, the right effort is to take a deep breath and relax the tension. The body and the mind are one system. A happy body is a happy mind and vice versa. Yeah. What if it doesn't work? Well, that's... <laughs> You have to do it. Yeah, so what if it doesn't work? Right? That's in the future. You just do it, okay? It's like uh, you can worry about whether it's going to work or not till, like for the rest of your life and not do it. I recommend doing it. So I, I can, like, when I go snowboarding, I could say, oh, what if, what if I can't do the jump? I just do it. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you, dude. Like, that's the same way meditation works. I mean, you learn by doing. You may fall down. You may not do it, but does, it doesn't mean you, you don't stop doing it. Okay, forget about that one. Just never mind. Start again. Let me give another shot. Every moment is a new moment. Every breath is a new breath that can be enjoyed. Um, I, I mean, but at no point while you're alive is there going to be no tension in your body. You know, that's so, not true at all. You can experience a, a tension-free body, a totally. No, but you can't body. sit up straight and not have tension. That's what your muscles do to keep you upright. Like it's a literal physical force keeping you from just flopping over. You know what I mean? Well, um, you can, your muscles can your muscles can still be working without without being tense. Like well, my, I guess we're, we're tripping over the word tense, like. If I pull a rope tight, there's tension there, right? Right. And that's what would hold up a stick would be if I have a leaning stick, right? And gravity is trying to pull it down, but I have a string on the top of it and that string is pulled tight by the gravity of the stick. It's tense and that's what's holding the stiff stick up. If you add a bunch of rope suddenly to the to that distance the stick's just gonna fall because there's no tension from the end of the stick to whatever's holding the other end of the rope so you know what i mean it, i mean it's there's no need for more tension than what's holding the the stick up right the the added tension would not be necessary it wouldn't be necessary to have a really heavy stick and then a super strong metal cable right your stick is what it is. It only requires as much tension as it needs to be in the angle it's in. So you don't need to like press on it more and 
and say, why is there so much tension here? And like, try to get rid of the fact that you have a stick under tension. The body is a living thing. It's like, you don't control every single cell in inside it. Right. It's like, you don't like the tension. You don't like this realm of things you can't control and you're tripping over. That's where you're upset. You're upset that I'm supposed to be able to fix every problem that I'm perceiving in my body, but I mean, good luck with that. How about just fix not being a, having an attitude where it's like, these problems are mine and I'm going to be the one who solves them for me. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I don't would know like if that lands, but. So if you guys are interested in experiencing jhana, you have to get rid of the tensions in your body. There's no other way. Um, in the suttas, it says directly uh, in the Anapanasati Sutta, as I breathe in long, I know that I breathe in long. As I breathe in, uh, I relax the bodily tensions. In the suttas, it says it's directly translated to tranquilized bodily formations. Uh, tranquilized bodily formations, but really what that means is you relax the tensions in your body. Um, yeah, but what I'm saying is like if you are sitting there in any posture other than lying flat on the ground and someone came up with a tranquilizer, you would see what tension you had in your body, whether you are in jhana or not. Like you, you would fall, you would, you would, gravity would take you and you'd go and all the tension would be gone. Because it's so, tension that holds I'm, you erect. I'm, I'm not talking about the concept of your body. I'm talking about the direct experience of your body. And in jhana, you, in the direct experience of... Um, and your body is not actually a permanent thing either. It's just changing sensations. So I'm only experiencing the current sensation of my body. Um, and it is possible in your direct experience... To not be experiencing any bodily tension whatsoever. In fact, it's but, that's, but your experience is not the body. The body well, exists, and the therefore body? you like, can have an experience. So, so Aaron, this is a good. This is a really good point. If you didn't have a body, you would um, not be having an experience of no tension. So you have your direct experience of the body, and then you have the concept of what the body is. And in meditation, we're not interested in our concept about the body. We're interested in the direct experience of it. So the direct experience of whether or not there's dukkha or not. Um, I don't care right. if conceptually. No, but the word tension is, is like a physical thing, right? Which, I mean, are you denying the existence of causes and conditions that create the physical realm? Like. There are causes and conditions, no? Yeah. Um, Whether we experience them or not, they're there. No? Yeah, I mean, there's you could call that a concept, but it's but, we know it's true, right? It's our knowledge. But we're but the only causes and conditions um, the Dhamma really ca um, cares about is the causes and conditions of dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. Right. Um, but, the, the Buddha said time and time again, "I teach one thing and one alone." Uh, sure. Dukkha Niroda. But Veda was talking I'm about not, tension I'm in not, the body, right? I'm so not thinking. Does the body, does the body have to go it. away for Dukkha to go away? Um, I'm not trying to get in an argument with your ontological presuppositions about reality, but. Um, the fact that the body exists is a presupposition about reality? Yeah, it's a presumption, actually. You don't know it exists apart from the direct experience. So why don't we address. Veda's presumption about the tension in his body. The tension is the tension, so it's not a presumption. What? Where? You're either ex it's you're just either, an experience. You're either experiencing tension or you're not. Okay, so we're talking about the tension in his experience, not in his neck. So you can have uh, a tension that we call neck tension that is really just a sensation. Right, it's a sensation that we've categorized as neck tension, but that sensation uh, 
is not satisfying sensation. It's a dukkha right. sensation. But it's the not satisfyingness that makes it dukkha. It's not the tension because, like I said, you can experience the tension in anything. I can grip a baseball and experience that tension. That's an experience of tension, right? So there's a, a difference is the judgment, right? So there's tension, but if I experience this at unsatisfying, it's tension. If I experience this as not uh, as satisfying, it's just a bodily sensation. Yeah. So I'm no, labeling attention and not wanting bodily it sensations see. that exist obviously in this world, my body. Yeah. So if your body is uncomfortable, the right effort is to relax your body. Now, if you would like to sit and be uncomfortable and have a tense body, by all means, be my guest. And whatever justification you have for it, nobody's stopping you. But uh, <laughs> I have a recommendation for a different way to meditate, um, to actually relax the bodily ten uh, tensions in your body so that you can experience a more clear state of mind, undistracted and uh, unagitated. Um, yes, DJ, you, you, you're going to say something? Oh, yeah, no. So this is this is quite useful, though, discussion, just talking about, again, delving into to the tension and what we mean by that. But also, I, I would like to say, like, really, yeah, it's sort of like, again, putting in the right effort to relax the tension is very helpful to take those breaths to breathe into the sensation and just yeah. But I think what is really helpful, too, is to again, one that sensation when that arises right is also to not be averse to it when it comes up because that will just perhaps cause the tension to to clench even more if you will like to really go into that right to become averse because again the disliking there can be the disliking of the tension like maybe the tension you could almost say oh this is an unpleasant sensation right but then if that becomes aversion then we start to get the attachment and all that stuff and then dukkha gets born right but again, if we can, again, putting in the effort to to relax the tension is very helpful, right? And it's a lot easier to do if you have the confidence of like, oh, okay, cool. That's just a, a little sensation here and we can just breathe into that. And oh, it's so nice. And enjoy the process because if we have conceptualized too, some kind of perfect far out there supreme relaxation, right? And that's not here. And we're like craving after that. Guess what? Duke is back, baby, because it's born through the craving, through the lusting after it, lusting for experience to be different. But again, we can still put in the effort to change to make it so, yeah, it is more pleasant. It is relaxing. We can really relax the body. And so, again, it's it's kind of that nice little balance there. <laughs> right. That's a good and point. So there's also a limit to that, right? There's a limit to how much, you know, if somebody's injecting you with testosterone and and, you know, like whatever that's going to like turn you into some like walking zombie where you can't control your limbs there's only so much you can do about that right <laughs> you might be a little bit more aggressive a little bit more horny <laughs> but uh i don't know if testosterone turns you into a zombie per se um <laughs> uh uh but yeah yeah no but no, the, I actually do the opposite. I, I picked the wrong chemical. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but the, the uh, point I was going to make is um, when your mind is happy, your body is happy, whether you <laughs> realize it or not. So when, when you talking yourself into a wholesome state is the same as re relaxing bodily tensions. So you can attack from either angle. If if relaxing. So, yeah, don't get stuck to one method. If if relaxing the bodily sense uh, tension doesn't resonate and you find yourself um, fighting with your body and it, it makes the tension worse, well then just, yeah, you can just think, okay, I'm totally fine with that tension. I can be happy anyways. And so you talk yourself into a satisfied state and uh, talking yourself into a satisfied state and thinking wholesome thoughts before you know it, just like a headache, you don't even notice when it's gone. The tension is gone. It's completely gone in your body. Um, but and that's how this, it works. This idea really creates craving for me because every time I sit down to meditate, I have 
like really cramping in my face like noticeably i can if i feel myself i see my nose twitching and that would mean i was never able to get into a good satisfied state during meditation but i believe i did yeah i have a question do you spend a and lot of time interacting with people's faces and like having to perform for them no, I'm like uh, IT and sitting on in front of my computer and not having to interact with anyone in my life. That's interesting. Well, so, um, geez, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so the facial tension um, uh, comes from the mental tension. And, oh, yes, Marcel. Um, thinking about um a past meditation that wasn't going good is um what what we're trying to get rid of here so instead of thinking about whether you did the meditation correctly or whether you're going to do the meditation try just try it do it with us right now try to relax try to um think wholesome thoughts right now <laughs> don't think about the problems that's come up before or the problems that might come up because those can never be solved. The only solution is actually doing it in, in this moment. But yeah, you can get creative. Sometimes I have some tension in my face. So just, uh, just rub it out a little bit, you know, like, it's not like you have to be stuck to one formula of how to get into a wholesome state or one method or one thing. Oh, I got to think the thoughts or I got to do the breathing or I got to do it. The point, the result is better than the technique. So, um, And there's there's causes for the tension, right? There, it may be what you do. It may it may be something that you don't have control over. You know whether you can discern what's causing it or not. Um, what you can do is pay attention to it and see if there's there's thoughts associated with it, or you can see if. if if it's you know driving you like you said it's it's making your meditation difficult if it's making your meditation difficult maybe that's part of the meditation that you need is to to figure out whether or not that's a a, a problem like what is it about it that it's a problem is it because you think you're supposed to have ultimate power over the facial facial muscles is that the problem like why you don't no, like the, prob the problem pain? is like like that it makes me believe that that meditation that the past which i believe is like the right way to do is kind of difficult to get or whatever or to do in the moment because of this facial shit going on and and that that's a dukkha that creates the sensation well, maybe maybe the meditation isn't something that you know takes one of the aggregates and like melts it into like candle wax you know maybe the meditation is something that says you know what fuck this facial twitching shit i'm fine what's you know what's my big toe doing i don't care Yeah, you yeah, can just go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like, like you can if something's bothering you, the thought, a sensation, you just think about something else. You just, yeah. What is my big toe doing? You weren't paying attention to your big toe, right? Um, also, uh, practice. I weren't. <laughs> also, practice smiling. Okay, just a slight smile. Not a lot, just a little. Just a smooth drip. It's like a drip, like a drip of morphine. Just one drip after another. Just smooth drip it. And thinking about it, like the last hour you talked, 
it wasn't even always there. Yeah, of course it wasn't. It's only there when you're thinking about it. Yeah, man. <laughs> what I, you I guys are talking those. about right now is actually reminds me of a sutta called the relaxation of thoughts sutta where the buddha lists five ways you can relax distracting thoughts mm -hmm. it's They're exactly what you're saying right now you can okay. either pay attention to something else or you can just think a wholesome thought instead of it or you can relax the bodily fabrication associated to the thought or you can even uh, crush mind with mind. Yeah. It's the fifth way. Like a last when you have no other la last resort. Right? Yeah. It's actually the same thing you guys are talking about right now. Yeah. I it's think so. the clenching of the teeth, right? And putting the tongue, the to tongue the against the, the root of the mouth. Yeah. Um, I asked Tom Arado about that one, and he said, uh, like uh, it came up that like yeah that's for like uh really dangerous thoughts that you really need to get rid of right thoughts of harming yourself or other people or um or you're just um you're going full time at this thing and you become absolutely determined and nothing's working um last resort type of thing but uh you know i wouldn't recommend doing that method off the bat uh but yeah, if that's what stops you from thinking about killing someone or something terrible or something like that, then by all means do it. Um, but um, I think that's a good note to end it on. Uh, if anyone has any other thing that they want to pop in, uh, any closing remarks, please. Um, DJ? This is it. This is it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man. Lurie, is that how you say your name? Uh, it's Yuri. It's an I. Yuri. 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 Yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay. It was good to thank see you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to say thank you. Thank you, guys, for the exchanges and the your time and valuable thoughts. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys for showing up. Really appreciate it. And it's really good to see you, Aaron, as well. Um, Marcel. Bye. Thanks, all. Bye. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Hi, bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <It's a good laughs>